Hello, and welcome to A Health Podacy. If you were designing a system from scratch and you were saying, how do I want to provide decision support for patients to feel supported on their schedule, be able to talk to somebody who figures out what the right place for them? Urgent care probably isn't it, right? I'm your host, Alan Weil. Urgent care centers provide convenient access to healthcare services. They're cheaper than a trip to the emergency room. They can take care of a broader range of healthcare needs than a retail clinic, and they have walk-in availability and extended hours unlike traditional medical offices. The number of urgent care centers has grown rapidly, but they have not grown at random. They're concentrated in higher income areas, for example. And they've grown in part due to venture capital investment, which presumably means they expect to get some financial returns serving a well-insured population. So what effect does the existence of urgent care centers have on overall healthcare spending? That's the topic of today's health policy. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Ari Friedman, an assistant professor at the University of Pennsylvania. Dr. Friedman and his co-authors published a paper in the April 2021 issue of Health Affairs, examining how patterns of care change when an urgent care center enters the mix. Dr. Friedman, welcome to the program. Thanks. It's great to be here. Well, let's uh, start with the basics. I've driven by urgent care centers a hundred times. I've seen their big lights on at night. Where'd they come from? How do they fit within our healthcare system? As you mentioned, urgent care centers are exploding. Um, There's certainly a lot of them coming around. Uh, They're actually somewhat old. I think the the oldest are in, you know, traced back to the seventies, but their growth has been starting kind of in the 90s on, and then more recently driven by venture capital, as you mentioned. Uh, at this point, just to give you a sense, there are like 3,000, 3,500 emergency departments in the country. It turns out we actually don't know how many urgent care clinics there are in the country, even with our study, but they're on the order of you know the better part of 10,000, so say six to 8,000 at least urgent care clinics in this country. So there are at least twice as many urgent care clinics as there are emergency departments. And I, I know this isn't the focus, but your comment that we don't actually know how many they are, are, presumably that has something to do with they're licensed somehow differently than hospitals where we know exactly how many of them there are. Is that why we don't know? That's exactly. Well, it's that and that there's a fuzzy border between what's an urgent care clinic and what's a primary care clinic. Oftentimes, people think of urgent care clinics, they think of urgent care or retail clinic, right? So to kind of contrast those, a retail clinic typically located in a pharmacy, has you know one to two treatment rooms, very low volume. So I've heard industry people say in the past that you need 20 patients a day kind of gets you a solid retail clinic setting. You know, Whereas an urgent care clinic, the average is 300 people a week in 2009 in Raman Weinick's paper. So they're you know higher volume. They're typically staffed by a physician, often a physician in the mid-level, uh, like an NP or a PA, um, and they have much greater treatment capabilities. They have extended hours. So that can catch people after work, they can catch people on weekends when their primary care doc is closed. That's a really important uh, factor here, that they're they're not all the same. We use the term, but they describe a range of activities. But fundamentally, they they sit somewhere between sort of the, the, the retail clinic and physician's office and the emergency room. So a critical question in your analysis is, how do they affect spending? Walk through the logic of how it is that this new center could reduce spending and how it is that it could increase spending because you were trying to figure out which of those goes on. This is all at this point, speculation based on, you know, I'm an emergency doctor. I work clinically um, based on kind of my sense of that. You know, I think there's ways that it could increase spending, as you point out, and ways it could decrease spending. So one of the ways that's potentially good and potentially bad, but would increase spending is what's sometimes called the woodwork effect, right? Where you know, if you lower the cost for something, people kind of come out of the woodwork and all of a sudden it's like, well, you know, I was going to suffer through this cold. There's an urgent care clinic that just opened down the street. I'll go, you know, get checked out. Maybe they'll have something to offer me therapeutically. Maybe it'll ha- turn out to have been a pneumonia or there's something that kind of will point the clinician towards doing, you know, a bigger workup. I'm trained as a health economist. So to me, that just means that demand slips down, right? You know, as price drops, volume increases. That's a normal thing. And the price here isn't just the dollar cost of the visit, but it's the wait time. You know, by the time a patient comes to see me in the emergency department, by the time we are actually talking face to face, it's been 
often an hour or two nationally, that's at least a half hour wait on average for an emergency department visit. That would be kind of access increasing, but it might, you know, would, would likely raise costs. On the other hand, if you catch people earlier in their disease process, if you give them access to a, a platonic ideal of a clinician who can, you know, reliably discriminate without doing too much testing, but exactly find the the one person in a hundred or one person in a thousand in a low risk setting who really needs to go to the emergency department and have a test or who, you know, is really sick and would have delayed presenting care for another day if this weren't there, then, you know, you could perhaps alter their disease trajectory. I'm a little skeptical that that many things in the health system save costs. It's very hard to find examples of things that save costs. In some sense, the the right metric for any intervention, whether it's a new clinic or anything, should be does it cost a little bit but give us a lot of value, right? So that's that's kind of remaining to be determined. And so value here takes on multiple shapes, and we'll come back to that. But uh, so, you know, at the opening, I said I've driven by these, so I have to confess I've actually been in a few. And I'm sitting here thinking of the the story you just told and, and a, a real life situation. It's always dangerous to extrapolate from our personal experience, but, but we have our personal experience. And I'm thinking of, of my daughters who had a, a an, an injury, and I literally look to see what time the urgent care center closed to figure out whether I thought how long I could wait to figure out if she was getting better because I knew that it wasn't worth going to the ER for it. But I thought, well, you know, if in an hour it's totally resolved, I won't go anywhere. Uh, But if I wait two hours, the urgent care center is going to be uh, not going to be an option anymore. And I'm going to have to go to the ED and that's uh, annoying and I have to wait Yes, it costs more, although for me at the time, that was the less critical issue. So so I just I think I just described a, my personal situation that covers both the potential cost saving and the po- possible cost increasing side, which is that had the clinic not been there, I might have waited and never gotten care and her foot would have gotten better and that would have cost the health system less money. Or I might have waited and it might have gotten worse. And I might have thought, I can't wait until tomorrow morning. I better go to the emergency room. And that would have cost the health system more money. Um, but because it was there, I sort of could could straddle that uh, decision process. And uh, who knows whether or not I made the right choice. But uh, but that's sort of the economics of it here, of, of adding capacity that could be lower cost, but also could lead people to use services they wouldn't otherwise. What do you find about, uh, because the, the issue here is low acuity emergency department. We're talking about, no, we're not talking about someone who's in a car crash. We're talking about someone with something that potentially could uh, be treated relatively easily. What do you find about what changes when an uh, urgent care center enters the market? Sure. Yeah. So so just to kind of frame, you know, the, the previous works, we kind of had a sense going into this that probably there was some effect. But we were mostly concerned with the magnitude of the effect for exactly the cost reasons that we've discussed, right? So if every urgent care clinic visit directly leads to one emergency department visit, one lower acuity emergency department visit not happening, then we would call that a you know a substitution ratio of one, right? One to one. And you know, whereas if it's a hundred to one, then that's a different ball of wax. We looked at it in a few ways. So one is just to look on average. So we had data from a commercial health insurer. We're looking at the zip code level across the entire country, really 50 states. We divided zip codes up into like a highest use group. So greater than 90th percentile of urgent care visits and a no use group where they never had any urgent care visits, where there was no urgent care clinic that ever opened in that zip code. And then kind of an intermediate group, which we talk about some, but mostly we focus on this distinction. And we find a 39% decline in lower acuity emergency departments over our study period. 12 years in the highest use group and a 31% decline in the no use group. So that's kind of consistent with some earlier data, including um, from my mentor on this project, who uh, Ativ Marotra, um, who's integral to this paper as well. Um, I should also mention Bill Wong, who uh, was the first author in this paper did amazing work pulling this together. So, so that's kind of consistent with some of you know Ativ's work previously with Sabrina Poon that showed kind of a secular trend overall in the country towards 
a general decline in emergency department visits over time. That's a big change from if you looked a decade ago, emergency department visits seemed like they were just going up and going up and going up forever. And at the same time, you know, as we discussed, urgent care clinic visits were skyrocketing. So we tried to say, okay, well, is it in the places where the urgent care clinic visits are going up that the emergency department visits are going down, right? So as you can see from that first finding, you know, 39% decline in lower acuity emergency department visits is big and certainly bigger than the places that had no urgent care clinic visits. But those zip codes are different in a lot of ways. And so then we tried to say, well, let's do this. Let's take each zip code. Let's compare it to its own trend in what we call a fixed effects regression. And then let's see what happens there. And so with that, we come up with a substitution ratio of 37. So that's kind of the main finding of the paper that every, uh, 37 more lower acuity or urgent care visits, which is most of the urgent care visits, are associated with one fewer lower acuity emergency department visit. So we're going to take that number and turn it into what that tells us about uh, healthcare and health system organization, but we'll do that uh, after we take a quick break. Hi, I'm Leslie Erdelac. And I'm Vabron Watts. Hey, Leslie, the Health Affairs Podcast Network is really growing. I know, Vabe, our new podcast, Health Affairs This Week, places listeners at the center of health policy's proverbial water cooler. Each week, our trusted editors discuss this week's most pressing health policy news, all in 15 minutes or less. So subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen and join the fun. And we're back. I'm speaking with Dr. Ari Friedman about the role that urgent care centers play in potentially increasing or reducing health system costs. When we went to the break, you uh, told us the top line finding from the study, which is the substitution effect. So since urgent care center visits are cheaper than emergency room visits, uh, you don't need a one-to-one -one replacement here to save money. Um, turn the major finding into sort of the bottom line question of whether overall the reduce, the the number of reduced visits offsets the cost of the increase in visits. Yeah, absolutely. So um, in 2019, the last year that we have data for, the average lower acuity visit to an ED cost $1,700 about. The average lower acuity urgent care visit cost $178, right? So that's almost a tenfold difference in cost. And by cost here, this is both the out-of-pocket cost that the person's paying as their copay deductible and the insurer cost. It's a 37-fold higher urgent care use than emergency department use in those zip codes. And it's a tenfold lower cost for the urgent care visit. So you can see where that's going, right? So that works out to... Um, about you know sixteen seventeen hundred dollars for the ED visit versus sixty three hundred dollars in urgent care spending, and indeed the total spending over that time period goes up. And the total spending, partly driven by uh, increases in the price of each emergency department visit, which have been pretty substantial over this time period, as well as the this increase in the, the urgent care volume. So you're seeing significant increase in utilization at this lower cost setting, but so much more so that it that it it costs the whole system money but when we began we said well you know they're they're convenient they're located in urban areas in places where people have insurance and uh, higher income so how do we think about the value of that convenience and how do we think about the decisions made by some of the investors in creating these urgent care centers you know, the, the economist in me wants to say that, you know, people who have no insurance at all, who are paying 100% out of pocket, still visit urgent care clinics. And the best data we have is from 2009, but seems to suggest kind of 13% of urgent care clinic volume is from people with no insurance whatsoever. Clearly, there's value being delivered here, right? That said, we know over and over and over again in healthcare, as your effective price goes down because you have insurance, you're going to consume more of things. In general, that includes healthcare. So, you know, we can we can't quite say, well, for, you know, 87 percent of this population, they're not exactly subject to that. So the usual economist trick of, well, people paid for it, so it must be worth it doesn't doesn't work here. I think that we're going to be left with 
questions for a while about you know what's what's the actual value to that and i think that in some sense we're left in a relative world of like do consumers get more value from this than they get from other kinds of spending yeah so i was thinking about that i mean i uh, again in my circumstance i suspect this is quite common the 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 out of pocket for urgent care is higher than a doctor's office visit but significantly lower than an emergency department visit it sounds like the underlying cost is a lot lower too. So again, if they were perfect substitutes, you'd say from the insurer's perspective, yes, I want you to go to the lower cost uh, site, uh, but that doesn't take into account the possibility that I'm that I wouldn't have chosen to go to the emergency department at all. Um, you know, this reminds me a little of some of the conversation about telehealth, not so much in the wake of COVID, where sort of everyone had to use it because they couldn't go into an office, but take that out of the picture. And the question was, we've opened up another more convenient method of getting care. And this in, in, in telehealth, of course, it's you can have it from the home. It clearly increases access. Is it worth it? And what, you know, to, to patients and to health outcomes and to the healthcare system uh, to have that additional option when like the work you're doing here, most of the evidence would suggest that it actually does have some net increases in cost. Do you feel like the lessons here are similar? I, you know, I've done some work kind of on like this idea of, you know, inappropriate emergency department visits. And I think the literature would support this idea that, you know, it's it's very hard to determine at a policy, to create a policy that would kind of discourage just the right people from the emergency department with not, without, you know, causing some harm by discouraging people who would come otherwise. Um, we've seen some evidence of that in COVID, right, where both very sick people and not very sick people have stayed home from the emergency department. To some degree, you know, telehealth, urgent care may be venues that people can get that support that they need to help decide, is this something that really needs, you know, an emergency department visit or something? So that would be, a, you know, a positive role. We, we almost certainly are seeing some of that in our data. You know, we didn't specifically look in this round, but, um, you know, there are almost certainly some double visits, right? People show up to the urgent care clinic, then they show up to the emergency department. Probably what happened is they said something concerning and they got referred to the emergency department. Does that increase costs? Absolutely, it increased costs, right? That's a visit that happened in two settings that didn't get offset, right? But is it a good thing? Maybe, right? You know, and is it, you know, do we want people to try urgent care a few times, before, you know, and to have a somewhat low threshold so they get that decision support? Maybe. There's lots of opportunities to provide uh renee shaw and brendan Slaughter and i previously called like a push and pull approach to stop trying to kind of push people away from the emergency department and instead kind of pull them into better supports you know and i think urgent care can play an important piece of that i think that clearly given the magnitude of extra visits that are happening in urgent care that don't seem to be offsetting emergency department visits that they're may well also be a lot of sniffling sneezing but it's around the corner where they probably patients probably would have been okay staying home and so the value of that is really the value they get from it and how much the insurer wants to pay for that kind of role so i'm glad you've uh, turned us to the circle uh t turned the arc of the conversation toward the health of the patient and maybe this is the the right place to close because i am struck that you uh you know, we asked the question, does it cost more or less? And I talked about the value being convenience, and that certainly is a value. But there is this other value, which is a, a contact with a patient that can lead lots of different places. You mentioned potentially a, a cause for alarm that sent someone to the emergency room, but it could also be encouragement of a management of a chronic condition or uh, uh, identification of something that was completely invisible to the patient. So my closing uh, comment slash question really revolves around the notion that you're studying this in a fee-for-service model where what, of course, the underlying costs are the costs of the staff and the clinic and the, 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 the technology and the like, but, but what you're measuring is what was paid for it because we pay piece by piece. A lot of the discussion around making care more convenient, which was the term I used, whether it's telehealth or or home-based care is really about improving care to make it more patient-focused and more accessible and, and tailored to the needs of the patient. You don't worry if you're in a system that isn't paying fee-for-service, you're asking, does this help improve 
the long-term outcomes for the patient, not just did it this visit cost X number of dollars. So I just wonder as we're having uh, finishing up our conversation, with, whether you have any thoughts on the relative focus on the dollars and cents as opposed to the health uh, benefits or negative consequences for patients in having all these care modalities. I mean, I think the size of the dollars matters a lot, right? So, you know, if sixteen, seventeen hundred dollars for a lower acuity emergency department visit, and there's six thousand dollars in in offset, that's a lot of thousands of dollars that a value that you have to deliver in that kind of care coordination role. So, I think if you were designing a system from scratch and you were saying, "Do I want patients to, you know, how do I want to provide decision support for patients to?" feel supported on their schedule, be able to talk to somebody who figures out what the right place for them, like urgent care probably isn't it, right? But if the goal was to reduce emergency department visits, I think they've clearly done that. If the goal was to reduce emergency department visits and save costs, I think they clearly haven't done that. So that leaves us where we are. Well, that is where we are with a lot more to study and uh, a lot more evolution of the care delivery system. Well, uh, Dr. Friedman, thank you so much for the paper and for the time you spent with me on a health policy. This was uh, such an important topic and one that is uh, not going anywhere. So I look forward to what you do next on it. All right. Well, thanks so much. This was truly a pleasure. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed today's episode, I hope you'll tell a friend about a health policy. Health Policy is produced by Health Affairs, the leading journal for health policy research. The team behind the show includes Patty Sweet, Jeff Byers, Julia Vivolo, Sarah Kolk, and Sue Ducat. Like the show? Subscribe to A Health Policy on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Google, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Thanks for listening, and have a great morning, day, or evening.